case unique in criminal history that would create global fascination. Another serial killer is in the news. This killer does not fit the typical profile. Six men shot in cold blood. She was a danger to any man she picked up on the highway. A brutal killer stalks the state of Florida. Hey, you want to help me make some money? I really feel she was evil, one of the most evil people I've ever been around. Highway hooker turns serial killer. She hated me. That's exactly why she killed. Made it real easy to pull the trigger. This is the remarkable story of the investigation into the world's most infamous female killer. She was more of an animal. She frankly needed to be put down. I'll be up in heaven while y'all rotting in hell. Daytona, Florida's most famous beach and a magnet for vacationers in America's retired. As the 1980s draw to a close, a dark cloud is brewing over the Sunshine State. December 1st, 1989, police recover an abandoned vehicle. The car has been stripped of ID and wiped clean of prints. The owner is missing. Lieutenant Steve Binagar is initially unconcerned. A lot of people go missing in this state because it's a very transient state. I mean, the state of Florida attracts people from little, literally worldwide. A gruesome discovery five miles away from the abandoned car plunges detectives into a murder investigation. Police struggle to identify the corpse. Decomposition takes place pretty fast in Florida with the humid weather and the heat and everything and with the animal activity, also the bug activity. Senior crime lab analyst Merv Stevens is familiar with the difficult process of identifying bodies. A lot of times the, the performing doctor will go ahead and remove the hands, send them to a, a crime laboratory, and then I may have a day or two to work on them. It's a very uh, tedious process, uh, something that we don't look forward to doing, but somebody has to do it. From the fingerprints, police identify the victim as divorced electrician Richard Mallory, shot four times with a 22 caliber pistol. What are you doing? Mallory was on his way to Daytona when he was shot and robbed, but for items of little value. Detective Brian Jarvis tries to work out a motive for the murder. When you're doing a criminal investigation, you look at every possibility you can, so you don't miss something. The police have little to go on, and the trail goes cold. Then, three murders in three months. Divorcee David Spears. Soon to be married, Charles Karskadon. And family man, Troy Buras. Investigators notice a chilling similarity in each of the killings. Each of these cases involved somebody being killed with a 22 caliber, which is typically more of a woman's gun. People don't usually use a 22 caliber gun to do murders, and yet we have three of them right in central Florida. It's not a powerful weapon. and is usually used for self-defense. The same small caliber gun was used to kill Richard Mallory. And there is a similar pattern to all four murders. They were in a vehicle, they were white, they were male, my age or even just a little bit younger. The seats in the vehicles were pulled to their forwardmost position. And that would be a common thread, uh, which is a little unusual. But as police begin to make the connections between these murders, a killer continues to stalk Florida's highways. Come on in. Retired police chief Charles Humphreys is on his way home to his wife of 35 years when he stops to pick up a hitchhiker. Mm. 
Atlas. If you want money, I've got money. With a fifth man lying dead, police are rocked by the realization that they are hunting a serial killer. A task force is set up to analyze the murders and draw up a profile of the killer. What kind of person could get close enough to all of the victims to perpetuate this crime? All the particulars to the individual crimes were discussed. There was a timeline set up for all the uh, individual victims' time of death and items that had been found. Forensic investigator Ward Schwoob is part of the team looking for patterns that could unmask the killer. That's when the linkages actually started forming for me. Condition of the victim's bodies led investigators to speculate that it might be a murder uh, by a prostitute or someone that was out commissioning for, for sex. Where there were um, some partial nudity of the victim, plus there were some evidence of uh, discarded condoms. Something extraordinary begins to dawn on the task force. Could it be that the serial killer they need to catch is a woman? Get out of the car! Five men shot. Their bodies in cars scattered across Florida's interstates. Just move now. Now. County detectives believe they have a highly unusual case on their hands. They suspect the killer they are looking for is female. Soliciting along the highways to get close to the men she robs and murders. There was no other documented female serial killers that we could think of. You wonder how do they act as compared to a male serial killer. The fifth and latest victim is retired police chief Charles Humphreys, who is returning home from his job as a child welfare officer. When we examined the body further at autopsy, it looked like he had actually been spinning and was being shot as he was turning, like he was trying to get away. The painstaking search for clues at Florida's Central Crime Lab is frustrated by the killer's attention to detail. Lab analyst Merv Stevens processes the evidence in the hope of finding a single print. The individual that was committing this crime was very methodical as far as trying to wipe down all the evidence that they knew possible that may lead the, the crime scene back to them. Frustrated by the lack of evidence to move the case on. Unsolved crime files are reopened in a bid to try and find a lead. The case of missing missionary Peter Sims stands out. Peter Sims was a middle-aged man traveling alone on Florida's interstate. Investigators discover that Sims's abandoned car was found not far from where the four other victims' vehicles were dumped. We felt there could be a very good connection here between Peter Sims' vehicle and the other homicides that were occurring. Other cars had been wiped clean, other vehicles had their license plates removed, and every other vehicle had the seat pulled forward. But with the Sims case, there's one crucial difference. The missing man's car has been crashed, and there is a vital piece of evidence inside. A bloody palm print. The, uh, the palm print being made in blood makes it a very fragile type of print. If you start moving around too much, the print will actually almost just fall to pieces. It is the first definite clue for the investigators. I theorize that she had touched her forehead and noticed that she had some blood and grabbing the armrest to release the door handle uh, is where the, the palm print was found. And unless you take the armrest off, you wouldn't see the palm print. Finding the killer's print is a major break. Merv Stevens works on the critical job of analysis, but the Seams case has provided another vital lead. The police have an eyewitness account from a local resident who was close to Seams's car. 
on the day it was crashed and then dumped. There were a couple people outside of her house using her hose. She noticed they had blood on them, and they were rinsing the blood off. Detectives are staggered. A whole new twist is added to the investigation. The sketch, based on the eyewitnesses' accounts, shows not one but two female suspects. Do investigators now have two serial killers on their hands? It was overwhelming. My, I can remember my first thought is, what do we do next? But detectives have little time to think before another body is discovered. Normally with a body dump, you have some other evidence there. In this particular case, there was none. It appeared to me that someone had gone to great lengths to try and hide the identity of uh, the decedent. The seventh victim is identified as trucker and reserve police officer Walter Antonio. What forensics notice at the crime scene is vital. We could see indentations on his hands where he had rings that had been removed. We saw an indentation on his wrist where a, a wristwatch had been removed, but none of those were in the immediate area. If detectives could locate these missing possessions, they could lead directly to the killer. Police begin an extensive search of Florida's pawn shops in the hope of finding evidence. 30 bucks, signed here. But they know time is not on their side. We realized that the frequency of the homicides was increasing. And we knew we had to act quickly because we didn't want to have anybody else killed. We see. Should they go public with the sketches of the suspects in the hope of generating leads? There was parts of the team that, you know, did not want to release these sketches. They did not want to go public with them. Did not want to go public with the idea that we might be looking at a serial killer. You could have the suspects realize that we're close to them and leave the area. There were some, some downsides to it. The police decide they have to take their risk. It's a subject that seems to horrify and fascinate us at the same time. Another serial killer is in the news. But this killer does not fit the typical profile. Decision because once you release that, you don't know how the public's going to react. If they're going to panic, if they're going to help, uh, what's going to happen, and you really have to be prepared for it. And at this point, we were prepared to release them. Within hours, hundreds of tips come flooding in. There was a sketch of a lady that looked very much like a lady I'd picked up the night before. It said that they suspected there might be a woman going around as a serial killer. And it said, you know, if you've had an encounter with anybody that resembles this person, you know, contact the police. So I told my wife, I said, I should probably give the police a call, and I did. Ted Teschner is one of many who respond to the appeal for information. I was uh, heading north on the road and um, pulled over because I thought at the time that... Uh, you know, a lady getting picked up by some guy might get hurt. I thought I was doing a nice thing by picking her up. And I said, well, you know, you're welcome to take a ride in there. She got into the car. She had a bag that she was fidgeting with in her hands. She asked me, you know, do you think I'm a prostitute? I thought, well, that's a strange question. I said, no, I just thought you were a lady that was in need of a ride. I wasn't picking her up to get those services. So, you know, she didn't want to stay with me long. The investigators can now begin to build up a profile of the suspects. The leads coming in were pretty good. You don't always get that lucky. They point to two women who stay in the Daytona area who match the description of the eyewitness sketch. Part of the leads indicated that they had stayed at the Fairview Motel under the name of Cammy Marsh Green in room number eight. We had the Volusia County Sheriff's Office check their porn records to see if there had been anything pawned in, in any of these names. And what they found was that Cammy Green had actually pawned a couple of items. We got the pawn tickets from them, and one of those pawn tickets included the items that had been taken from Richard Mallory, a radar detector and a 35 millimeter camera. Let's pull this out. Police quickly realized that Cammy Marsh Green is a false name. But the pawn shop has provided detectives with a vital piece of evidence. All right. At that time, 
you were required to put a fingerprint on the pawn ticket. Well, fingerprints don't lie. Thumbprint, thumbprint here. The print is rushed to the state's fingerprint lab. Director Jenny Ahern runs it through the automated identification system. I ran the print numerous times to no avail. I also had a coworker of mine run the print to no avail. The automated system does not contain every print that the state holds. Ahern prepares to search through the database manually. It's an awesome undertaking. We really knew we were looking for the needle in the haystack. The killer is still at large, and it looks like it will take Ahern and her colleagues weeks to search through hundreds of thousands of records. We take out a chunk of cards at one time, and you physically, with your bare eye, flip through each card, eliminating prints that are not close. I had only been in a drawer for about 15 minutes. I had taken out one set section of the cards. I'm flipping through, looking at each card, one at a time. And within 15 minutes of the first set, I found a card that I felt was close. I could not even breathe because I was so excited about the possibilities of this, that we may actually have found this woman. So I've looked at it, looked at my print, looked back at it again, looked back. We knew we were looking for a white female. Turn the card over, it's a white female. I was just beside myself. They traced the print to a woman whose name is Eileen Wernos. Take care. She had been previously arrested for possession of a 22 caliber nine shot revolver. So we're thinking this is definitely a person that we need to take a hard look at. Investigators need to establish detailed information about the prime suspect. Hey, baby, how much? Come on. She traveled in these circles of, you know, drugs and alcohol and prostitution. She seemed to always gravitate back to the Volusia County area. We decided to put some surveillance teams out. It was a very much a long shot. The team begins combing Daytona in the hope of tracking Wernos down. Mike Joyner is one of the undercover officers trawling the bars, while his colleague Tom Tittle is part of the backup squad. We were essentially divided up into shifts. Uh, myself and a few others were on the midnight shift, so sleep during the day, and at nighttime, we would go around the city trying to fill in, like, uh, into the bars, into the low-life areas. Joyner poses as an out-of-town drug dealer from Georgia, looking for a good time. We'd go to a bar and get out and go in and, and deal up to the bar and kind of drink a beer. The trail for Wernos leads them to a notorious biker bar, the last resort. It was pretty unique. The ceiling was made up of bras and women underwear, where they had evidently taken them off and put in the ceiling, you know, stuck them up in the ceiling with pins and stuff. Owner Al Bulling confirms that Eileen is a regular at the bar, usually drinking with her lesbian girlfriend, Tyria, who she's been seeing for nearly a year. She used to come in with, uh, with a girlfriend, Ty. They'd come in for a few beers, hang out for a little while, and take a leave, and the next day they'd come back in, then they'd be gone for a few days, and just like, like anybody else. But days go by, and neither woman shows up. Detectives discover that Tyria and Eileen have separated, leaving Wernos brokenhearted. They fear she may have left town. Finally, one night, I got lucky, and I walked in a bar, and there she was. The investigators had put together as a sketch what she looked like, and there was no doubt 
the lady I was looking at in that bar right then was Ali Marlowe. Wanna help me make some money? No, I'm not interested. Get out of here. Get out of here. She made it quite clear that she was a lesbian and she was a street walker, and that's how she made her money. Have detectives finally cornered the killer? State prosecutor Dave Damore knows the stakes are high. If she were to lose surveillance and go out and kill somebody, can you imagine trying to explain that to a group of journalists? Why, knowing that you have the chief suspect, that you were able to lose her and she committed another murder? Want a drink? Damn right. Can Joyner lure the streetwise Wernos into his trap? He needs to secure evidence so police can charge her with murder. My thinking was we found her. We know where she's at, let's don't lose her. I don't want to be her next victim. Two, please. Undercover officer Mike Joyner needs hard evidence fast so the state can charge Wernos with murder. How's it going? It's going. If the operation fails, more men could die. She wants cigarettes, I buy her cigarettes. She didn't have any money. She want a cigarette? Yeah. As Joyner strikes up a rapport with Wernos, his support team waits anxiously nearby. My group was set up directly across the street from the bar. There was others down the street. And so we had our wire where we could listen to all the conversation that was going on because Mike had the wire on his body. What are you hanging around for? Are you going to screw or what? We conferred with the undercover officers, too, because they would come and go out of the bar. Um, and uh, these two guys were excellent undercovers and I you know I have a great amount of respect for them them personally and and people who can do that kind of work as the investigation closes in on Wernos the team listening in agonizes over what to do next my difficulty was is that my job would be to get a conviction based upon evidence evidence that I didn't have yet effectively what we had was a lot of circumstances we could put her in a lot of places but we couldn't put a gun in her hand is that, is that the key to your hotel room over there? Is that where we're going? No. No. What police want to find is the murder weapon. If Wernos has a 22 caliber gun in her possession, it'll be crucial evidence. I honestly believed that they, she had a gun in that bag. So what you got in the suitcase? A little something sexual for later? Relax, I get, I get you another one, I get you another one. Relax, relax. It was starting to get intense because we knew we can't lose her. And we, of course, the safety of the officers was paramount. I said, we've got to arrest her. We cannot let her leave here on the back of a Harley Davidson. Do I think I was gonna be the next victim? Yes, I'm I sure will do now. But if I had a family and I sure did want to get back to them. I was ready at the last bar. The plan is for Joyner to lure Wernos outside so armed officers can arrest them both, making sure that Joyner's role as an undercover officer is not revealed. I said, I'm going to go get a motel room. I'm going to bring you the key. You need to go take you a bath because you stink. You okay? Just stay here, all right? I said, you stink and I stink. We ain't bathed in two or three days. I guarantee you now, some of us need some water and soup. Hey, 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 look what I got. Look what I got. Get your bag. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let me get my beer. Don't get lost. Don't get lost on me, dog. Stop! Stop! Police! What, what, what's this about? Hands what behind you? your head. What's this all about? I didn't do anything! I didn't do anything! They had to put us in the back seat of the patrol car to yell. And I really jumped on her pretty hard at that point. What the hell did you do? Why are we in here? I don't know. I think they think I killed somebody. Finally, when it was over, it was like a big calm after a hurricane. Detectives hoped to find the murder weapon in Wernos's suitcase. But there's no gun inside. Now, once you take somebody into custody, 
there is, you know, there are certain time limits that you can hold them in custody depending on, you know, the type of case. So, you know, the clock was ticking against us. Police can only charge Wernos with an outstanding firearms offense from the late 80s. There is real concern that without sufficient proof to charge her with murder, Wernos could soon be back on the streets. I think I made it very clear to the investigators that they had jumped the gun, in my opinion, that I was very unhappy with their decision, that I didn't have a case that I could prosecute successfully based upon the evidence as I saw it at that point. To make a murder case, detectives have to link Wernos to the crime scenes. Lab analyst Merv Stevens can finally compare the bloody palm print he found in missing man Peter Seams's car with an arrest print taken from Wernos. Once I had my photograph of the area, I tried to look for identifiers. In this case, this flexion crease that is appearing in the latent left and also in the ink palm print. Then I try to look for the uniqueness, and you can go through and find points of identity in both photographs. And I made a decision that it was her palm print that was left in Peter Sims's vehicle. But the palm print does not help their case. Police have not found Sims's body. Without his corpse, there's no proof of murder. With time running out, detectives mount a search to track down Tyria Moore, the second female suspect from the witness sketch and Wernus's ex-girlfriend. We didn't know with Tyria Moore how much she was involved at that point either, but um, we needed to locate her because we felt like that was going to be critical. Officers tracked Tyria down to her sister's home in Pennsylvania. I wanted to afford Miss Moore an opportunity not only to help me build my case, but to prove to me that she was not involved. And I felt the best way to do that was to put her in a position to assist us in our investigation and set up a surreptitious phone call between she and Aileen Warnos where they could converse about what had happened. Police realized that Tyria could be the key to securing a confession from Wernos. The confession was critical to, to breaking the case. I mean, to actually making it from, uh, well, this is probably the person that did it, to convicting this person. Tyria agrees to help. Police set a honey trap. I'm getting scared. Wow. I definitely don't think there's anything to worry about. Well, I'm pretty damn worried. I'm not going to let you get into trouble. We were sitting right there listening, and but she was very nervous about it and worried about it. And, I, and, and she, she had feeling for Eileen. You could tell she did. But I'm, I'm not going to jail for something you did. This isn't fair. Yeah, I don't think she wanted to go to jail for it, huh? She wasn't that of a fond of her. You didn't do anything. You evidently don't love me anymore. You don't trust me or anything. I mean, you're going to let me get into trouble for something you did. Listen, listen, quit crying and listen. I can't help it. I would die for you. Would you? That's the truth. I'd gladly die for you. I'll just wait for you on the other side. I love you. I really do love you. I love you a lot. I don't know whether I should go on living or just... I'm not going to let you go to jail. If I have to confess, I will. Eileen, we have six murdered victims. I want to know. It's make or break time for the case. Despite the damning honey trap call with Tyria, the police still need a full confession from Wernos to try her for first degree murder. As Wernos faces a police interrogation, public defender Michael O'Neill reminds his client of her rights. That's my job as a, a defense attorney to protect her interests at that point. I have to try and convince her not to make any statements and not to give any confession about anything and told her that uh, she had that right to remain silent and it would be my advice to her to use that right and don't, don't say anything. But no matter what I said, she wouldn't have it. Eight days after her arrest, 
Police finally I ask Eileen Wernos the question that proves decisive. I want to know, was Tyria involved in these killings? I did the killings. It was me. Go ahead and put me in the electric chair. Her total focus was on her friend and protecting her friend. She had, she showed absolutely no concern about herself and her own fate. The police tactic of convincing Eileen of the need to save Tyria from prosecution has paid off. Had it not been for that connection between her and Ty Moore, and I would give her this as far as some humanity, she was attempting to protect Ty Moore. You can't take that away from her. There is a, a link of humanity there. That's one of the only decent things that I saw her do. The more she talked, the more I realized that the consequences for her would likely be severe. Most of the time I was drunk as hell. It really didn't matter. I was a professional hooker. Made it real easy to pull the trigger. Forensic psychologist Dr. Glenn Caddy is shocked by the picture that emerges of Wernus's descent into a life of crime and prostitution. It was clear that this woman had an, an exceptionally, profoundly impaired history. I know that there was uh, a substantial amount of child sexual abuse to which she was subjected. Abandoned by her mother and pedophile father, Wernos was brought up by her grandparents. As an escape from the savage beatings from her grandfather, Lori Wernos, the young Eileen quickly learned to blank out her emotions and use any means by which to gain acceptance. By age seven or eight, she was hypersexual. I believe the records indicate that she was called a cigarette pig. Um, and the issues were that she would swap sex by age eight or nine for um, whether it be oral sex on a man or, or intercourse for uh, cigarettes um, and for money. The whole rearing experience and, and, and how she functioned was consistent with really high trauma events in childhood. At some point in time, I think Aileen had, had basically said, I've had enough. I'm tired of being taken from. I'm going to take. What more could she take than these men's lives? Having secured the vital confession, the next priority for detectives is to find evidence to make the prosecution case watertight. Is there any property that you might have collected from these victims that you stashed somewhere? Nah. I just flung them out the window as I was driving. Detectives tracked down a storage unit kept under Warnus's alias, Cami Marsh Green. The harsh truth is revealed. Warnos has hoarded personal possessions stolen from her murdered victims. A lot of these items were personal to the individual. They were briefcases, they were watches, they were rings. It may have been souvenirs, or it may have been a further attempt to try and um, hide the identities of the victims. And we were actually able to tick off items and establish what belonged to which victim. For police, this is vital evidence. For victims' families, a reminder of their loved ones. We have some hair here. Among the items is a hairbrush. Bag that. Peter Seems' son is asked to identify it. He kind of lifted it up in front of him, and his voice started to quiver. And he said, my father used to brush my hair when I was a child with this brush. And I remember the tears welling up in my eyes. And I was just about to cry. To this day, that image of that boy remembering his father brushing his hair with that hairbrush brings tears to my eyes. Get what are you, out of the car! What are you doing? What are you doing? Police have a confession. They have evidence to link Wernos to the victims. But to clinch the case, they need the murder weapon. With nothing left to lose, Wernos leads them to a small bridge close to the last resort bar. She had taken the handgun, which was a 22 revolver, 
set of handcuffs and also a pocket knife. And she'd place them in this cloth bag and then threw them as far as she could into the water. A team of divers went in and almost immediately found the bag. But Stevens is extremely concerned about the most critical piece of evidence. I had given the, the dive team and everybody instructions, put all the items in a bucket or a pail with the water that it came out of, because if you take it out, it's probably going to start rusting immediately. The gun has remained intact long enough to reveal yet more damning evidence against Wernos. Our firearms examiner was able to go ahead and out of the seven cases that she was charged with, I believe it was either three or four positively said that was the gun that was used in the commission of those crimes. Police now have enough evidence to proceed to court. A trial date is set for Eileen Wernos. The public is shocked as news of her alleged crimes hits the airwaves. Authorities call her the first true female serial killer. But now there is a new twist. Wernos claims the murders were committed in self-defense. The global media must await the trial of Eileen Wernos. Will she become the first convicted female serial killer in Florida's history? Eileen Wernos has been arrested and charged with the serial murder of six men. Made it real easy to pull the trigger. In a plea bargain, she admits to six murders, hoping to swap her confession for a life sentence rather than death row. I did the killings. It was me. But Wernos's plea bargain is rejected. She will be tried for her life. Break me. Or kill me. The main thing about Eileen Warnos was she was a female serial murderer. And that's why the state would be out to get the death penalty on her. First up is the murder of Richard Mallory, Eileen's first victim. Wernos pleads self-defense. You shot him immediately. Didn't give him a chance to say anything, did you? Am I supposed to stop the clock and say, rationalize with this guy who's about who wanted to kill me? She described herself as having her neck tied to the steering wheel by a steel cord and having it cut and bleeding. He was going to kill me. He was, in, he was going to beat the living daylight okay. time, choke me to death. There was no blood in the vehicle when it, was, when it was found by us, no trace evidence to suggest that she had been tied to the steering wheel. Wernus's testimony does not convince. Ex-girlfriend Tyria, who is not facing any charges, has become a state witness against her. We were sitting on the floor watching TV, and she just come out and said, I have something to tell you. And I asked her what, and she said that she had shot and killed a man that day. They've been up to my parents again. Their taped They've telephone conversation is powerful evidence account. against Wernos. I don't know whether I should keep on living or if I should... No time, time. <sighs> and what if they don't believe me? She is found guilty, and the judge imposes the ultimate sentence. Until by warrant of the governor of the state of Florida, you, Eileen Carroll Warnus, be electrocuted until you are dead. And may God have mercy upon your course. Warnus's claim of self-defense has failed to save her from the death penalty. Go back, go. But the judge had not allowed Wernus's legal team to present evidence that her first victim, Richard Mallory, had a previous conviction for attempted rape. The fact that he had a conviction years earlier didn't put the gun in his hand. She was the one that carried the gun. She was the one that had it with her. And she was the one that took it out and shot him. When the jury advised us that they were recommending to the judge that Aline Warner should be put to death, I felt it was justified. I was fine with it. Uh, I had no qualms in, in my heart or my mind that it was the right decision. In March 1992, Wernos pleads no contest to the murders of Charles Humphreys, Troy Burris, and David Spears. 
probably get three more death row sentences, and then I gotta go to Pasco and Dixon for two more de uh, death row. How many times you gotta kill me? Then, in June 1992, Wernos pleads guilty to the murder of Charles Cascadon. The following February, she is found guilty of the murder of Walter Antonio. She now has six death sentences on her head. The victims' bereaved families welcome the verdicts. She shot him seven times. She's just evil. She's a horrible, evil person. As the body of Peter Seams is never found, Wernos is not charged with his murder. As Wernos waits on death row, her defense team mounts an appeal against her sentence. If they can prove she's insane, she will escape the death penalty. You have the right to an appeal. Mr. Glazer, is that going to be handled by you May or the your wife and kids get raped. I would ask that uh, you would point right. the off. But Eileen Wernos insists she is sane. She instructs her legal team to drop her appeal against the death penalty. They comply with her wishes. She was controlling her own death because she was a volunteer to be executed. I'll be up in heaven while y'all rotten in hell. She did not have to be executed. She could have continued with her appeals and it would have been much more difficult for the state to execute her, even a serial murderer. I have made peace with my Lord and I have asked forgiveness. In 2002, Eileen Wernos has been on death row for 10 years. Debate rages as to whether she should face execution. Dr. Glenn Caddy assesses whether she is competent to face it. My conclusion was that this woman was extremely mentally unstable, that she was not competent because she was suffering a profound delusional disorder. But the state decides that Wernos is fit to face execution. It's time. At 9.45 a.m. on October 9th, 2002, Eileen Carol Wernos leaves her cell for the last time. Her agenda was that she wanted to die. She had expectations uh, that she was going to come back to Earth and that she was going to have a very powerful role to play when she came back. With the exception of killing these people, her background was one of tremendous powerlessness and ineffectiveness and, and loss. And so, in essence, this, this whole delusion was the presumption of having a, a new life. And so she couldn't wait to get there. Wernos receives a lethal injection. Her final statement was this exactly. I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June 6th, like the movie, Big Mothership and all, I'll be back. A year after her death, Hollywood releases a movie based on Wernus's life. Some of those involved in the case feel differently about the fictional portrayal of a woman they met in real life. I know that Hollywood has tried to portray her as an empathetic, sympathetic person driven to this. Uh, that was not Aileen Warnos. That was not her life. Give me that gun. I don't believe Aileen Warnos should have been executed. I felt that she was a hideously tragic figure. Her mental state was one of progressive deterioration from probably age four onwards. Her circumstances, all of them, 